God, we thank you for your word. May it live and breathe in us and bear much fruit for your praise and glory. Well, good morning, Dolby. It is such a privilege to be with you this morning. Uh, David and Zoe and the boys enjoying a well-earned rest. And uh, if we haven't met before, my name is Scott. Uh, I get the privilege of being able to be uh, the, the priest in charge here in Sunnybank in the southern suburbs of Brisbane. And uh, uh, I have a wife named Sarah and two boys. Uh, Ezra is three and a half. Amos is almost two. And we also have uh, the extra wonderful honour of being godparents to little, well, he's not so little anymore, little Jude, um, David and Zoe's youngest. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, I'm looking forward to exploring God's word with you this morning. Well, over Easter, we explored that beautiful and powerful truth that is death to life. We talked uh, over Easter about how Jesus' death put to death our sins and how Jesus' resurrection raised us to new life. And today we begin this new series, Fruitfulness, where we're going to look at what it means to live this new life that Jesus has bought for us. Before we get into the text this morning, it's good for us to remember that this new life, this new life that Jesus has bought for us is a gift. We have done nothing to deserve it. And so when we are given such an extravagant gift, when we are given such a precious gift, when we are given such an undeserved gift, we must seek to be good stewards of it. This gift of new life is literally life-changing. I don't know if you have experienced that life-changingness of this new life. And so with this in mind, we must not only seek to receive it with thanks, but we must also seek to use this new life-giving gift. Use it in the way that God intended us to use it. And so over the next seven weeks, we're going to look at what the spiritual gifts are. We're going to look at what the fruit of the spirit are. We're going to look at the practicalities of these gifts, which I'm really looking forward to. But each week, we're also going to focus on who and what these gifts are given for. And so today we see that these spiritual gifts are given for God. But then over the following weeks, we're going to see that they are also given for mission, for holiness, for others, for the building up of the body of Christ, for the world and for the supernatural sharing of the good news of Jesus. So that's where we're heading over the next seven weeks. But today we start our series in Exodus chapter 31, which is maybe not the place you thought that we'd start in a series on spiritual gifts. But in today's reading, it really gives us such a beautifully broad picture of what it means for God to empower his people for ministry and what it means for God's people to work for his glory. So let's jump into the text. Grab your Bible. Uh, I don't know if you have pew sheets printed out in, in Dolby. Uh, if you have one of those, great. Uh, either way, grab your phone, uh, whatever you can use, stone tablets. Let's look at Exodus chapter 31, verse 1. What we start by seeing in Exodus chapter 31, verse 1, is that God is giving an instruction to Moses. In terms of the story, God's story, Moses has rescued the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. He's done that by God's mighty hand. God is the one who provided freedom. They have passed through the Red Sea. Uh, not long after that, the Israelites whinge and complain. It's wonderful that we've got past that and we no longer whinge and complain, isn't it? 
And so we see in that passing of the Red Sea that God provides water and manna and quail in the desert. He provides their their daily needs. After that, the Israelites are attacked by the Amalekites. You might remember this story. It's not one that we cover very often, but it's really precious and beautiful. It's the one where God instructs Moses to hold his staff, the same staff that that split the Red Sea, uh, the one that did all the miracles in Egypt. God instructs Moses to hold his staff up into the air, sort of in this posture of praise. And as long as Moses holds his arms raised, God promises to fight for them and the Israelites win. But um, even now, after a few seconds, imagine Moses' arms got tired. And so they start by putting some rocks under them to hold them up. But at the end of the story, um, Aaron and this fella named Hur, they end up being the ones that hold Moses' arms up until the Amalekites are defeated. This fella named Hur, um, we might notice that um, when we read our reading this morning from Exodus 31, uh, Bez, Bez, Bezel, Bezel um, is a descendant of this Hur. So Aaron and her hold Moses' arms up in the air and God provides protection and he fights for them. God then provides the commandments. He gives them instructions on how to live as free people, free people who are devoted to God. And God doesn't just give them the Ten Commandments or or instructions. He gives them lots of instructions. These instructions get super detailed. They're about all sorts of things, from the building and the furnishing of the tabernacle, uh, which was their worship centre, through to their garments, um, crop rotation, how to keep the Sabbath day and other festivals holy, how to use the correct oil and incense, etc., etc. We can imagine that at the end of this big list of instructions that God Gives. We're talking about uh, 10 chapters of Exodus from chapter 20 through to chapter 30 that Moses might be saying to himself, gee whiz, this is a long list of jobs. How am I ever going to manage all of these things? I don't even have the skills to do these things. And so at the start of Exodus chapter 31 in today's reading, God says to Moses, hey, Moses, don't you worry, mate. I've been preparing people to do these things. I've already put these skills into people. Check out people like this Bezel. I've placed my spirit within him. Within him. He has wisdom. He has understanding. He has knowledge of all kinds of skills. In verses 4 and 5 of chapter 31, we read that that he knows how to make artistic designs with gold and silver and bronze. He understands how to cut and set stones, uh, how to work with wood and how to engage in all kinds of beautiful crafts. In verse 6, God says, Moreover, I've also got this guy, Aholiab, to help him. And also, I've actually given ability to all these different skilled workers. I've given them the skills to create everything that I've instructed you to do. And so we have this guy, Moses, and we might say that, well, Moses has the spiritual gifts in things like leadership, um, pastoring or shepherding people, uh, the working of miracles, which is fine when you're leading a group of people out of slavery. But now it's bigger than Moses. These people are a community, they're a nation, and there are lots of roles that need filling. These roles are bigger than Moses. Moses can't do these things on his own, and God says, don't worry, mate. 
That's why I've made everyone different. Bezel, who is like the foreman, he knows how it all comes together. He can see the big picture. He's the foreman. We have a Holiab, who's the assistant. He's the, the 2IC, second in charge. And we're told a bit later that a Holiab also um, specifically has the gift of teaching, being able to communicate these skills uh, to others, to upskill them and encourage them and, and make the, the work good. He's able to, to bring together the community to create something really special. And in verses 7 to 11, Oh, sorry, before that, God also says, actually, I've created all these men and women, not just these two, the foreman and the two I see. I've actually created um, each and every one of these people and I've placed in them different gifts and talents and I've surrounded you with these people. Moses, the idea is that you will work together to create this special thing. You will work as a team, as a, as a family, as a nation bound together by the Spirit of God. And so in verses 7 to 11, uh, the list of things that these men and women are to create is really a broad list of trades. These aren't the types of things that we'd usually think about when we talk about Spirit-given gifts. But they are. It tells us in the text that these are gifts from God, spirit. Everything from the craftsman's drawings to the smithing of gold, silver and bronze into the Ark of the Covenant, which had these amazing gold cherubim on top, so intricate these were to be made. Through to those gem cutters, the ones who work with precious stones, we have the woodcarver and the carpenter, the weaver, the needleworker, the tailor, all the way through to the early chemist and the perfumer. These people were to work with oils and, and fragrant incense. God made all of these people and placed them in the same community next to each other so that they could work together and accomplish the tasks that God had set in front of them. This story continues in Exodus chapters 35 to 40, but in Exodus chapter 36, Moses gathers all the people. Um, he's been given these instructions from God, and now he gives the instructions to the people, and he just says to them, Hey guys, God has invited us to do these things. Is there anyone who wants to partner with God? God, uh, God has invited us to, 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 to make all these little intricate things, things that, that um, we couldn't have possibly done in Egypt because we didn't have a home. And now he wants us to set him up, this house, this tabernacle, this worship centre. Is there anyone who wants to come and join in what is God is already doing? It's an amazing moment where God offers the people an opportunity to partner with him. And it says that the people open their hearts and metaphorically their wallets. They offer their God-given skills and abilities back to God. And together with God, they set out to accomplish his vision for his glory. It's a beautiful story, a beautiful story, a powerful story. So what can we learn from this? Here's five quick but really important things for us. Number one, God is still at work. Now, I know that this might seem obvious, but God is still at work and his invitation for us to partner with him in all the things that he's doing uh, continues to be offered. Whether it's things in our family or things in our church, things in our community, things in the world, God continues to say, hey guys, 
Do you want to come to work with me? Do you want to come and, and partner in this vision that I've got where the whole world would be, be unified and bound together by my spirit and, and know that they are loved and saved and, and reconciled to God? Do you want to come with me? God keeps on asking us each and every day that we wake up, do you want to partner with me today? I'm doing some really cool stuff today. Do you want to join in? And so point number one, God is still at work and still invites us to partner with him. Point two, it's God's work. Throughout all the scriptures, but especially in the book of Exodus, especially in Exodus chapters 31 to 40, it is super clear that this is God's work. God made the plans. God had the vision. God has the purpose. It's his work that he invites us to partner in. And the reason I say this is that sometimes we can forget that. We get mistaken in our thinking. We, we think, well, this is what I'm doing. This is what our church is doing. This is my plan. This is our church's vision. No. It must be God's plan. It must be God's vision. It must be God's purpose because it is God's work. Point three, we are God's people. It's God's work through God's people. God created individuals and instilled in them gifts and talents. Our reading tells us that each of these abilities are gifts of the Spirit's power to each of those individuals for the blessing of the community. The people would not have been able to complete their work if a whole bunch of individuals hadn't come together and said yes. Friends, this remains the same. There is no one like you. You are a carefully designed masterpiece in your own right. You are a gift from God. You are God's precious treasure. You are a gift to this community. You're a gift to the world in a way that no one else can ever replicate. And you might say, well, well little old me, I, I'm not anything special. Well, you are to God. There is no one like you, and God wants to do his work through each and every one of you. You are God's people for God's purpose, doing God's work. Point four, this work must be done God's way. I know that we sort of touched on this point in point number two, but it's not enough and it will never be enough. If God's people do God's work their own way, it will never turn out right. We must be following God's will and humbly seek his leading in every detail of the job. We make sure that we do not go astray. God's work through God's people, God's way. Point five, for God's glory. Even if we are able to accomplish much, we must always recognise that it is not us in our own ability that has accomplished it. God gave the wisdom. 
God gave the understanding. God gave the knowledge. God gave the ability. God gave the strength. God gave the desire. God gave everything. Anything we accomplish is only by his goodness and grace that is at work in and through us. Therefore, everything we do is always for God's glory. Friends, let's pray. Holy Spirit, Thank you so much for the gifts and talents that you have given each of us. Please help us to use our spiritual gifts to bless others, to build your kingdom and to glorify you. We ask this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen.